coming up on Network Africa. World leaders pledge not to interfere in Libya and to uphold a UN arms embargo to further peace. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says major powers are fully committed to a peaceful resolution in Libya. Plus, 20 African leaders gather in London for the first ever UK-Africa Investment Summit. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Tenyo Lash Ali. We begin today with stories and happenings that made headlines over the weekend, focusing majorly on the Berlin conference held in Germany over the crisis in Libya. German Chancellor Angela Merkel was on hand to welcome leaders to the summit while expecting Libyan rival camps and their foreign backers to attend to discuss ways to end the proxy war over the capital Tripoli and the oil producer which has displaced 140,000 and now more than half the country's crude output. Germany and United Nations hope to persuade Russia, Turkey, the United Arab Emirates and Egypt to push their opposing camps to agree on a lasting truce in Tripoli. On Saturday, the UN envoy to Libya said he hoped but could not predict whether eastern oil ports shot ahead of the summit would reopen soon. Ghassan Salami says the Berlin summit would most likely discuss the closures to avoid dragging on for weeks or months like previous seizures of facilities. If the thing is not solved between today and tomorrow, I expect the issue to be raised. In the meantime, the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on the sidelines of the summit met with the UAE foreign minister as Germany and the United Nations hope to persuade Russia, Turkey, the UAE and Egypt to push their opposing camps. As with previous failed attempts, center stage of the one-day meeting was occupied by Eastern Commander Khalifa Haftar, who in April started a campaign to take Tripoli. Western powers hope to put pressure on him to continue a ceasefire that has largely held for one week. Libya has been in a state of violent fluke since a NATO air campaign in 2011 led to the downfall of its strong arm leader, Muammar Gaddafi. Libyans themselves have been staging protests in rejection of the Berlin summit. Those in the eastern city of Benghazi said they were not expecting much from the summit and reject Turkish interference in Libyan affairs. As for those in the capital Tripoli, hundreds decried the internationally recognized government for agreeing to meet with Libyan National Army Chief General Khalifa Haftar, saying they had betrayed those who died in the fighting which erupted in April last year. And while leaders deliberated, Pope Francis prayed for the success of the summit on Sunday and that it will be the start of a path towards the end of violence and towards a negotiated solution that will lead to the peace and long-desired stability of the country. Meanwhile, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has said that major powers are fully committed to a peaceful resolution in Libya after that summit in Berlin. World leaders have pledged not to interfere in Libya's ongoing civil conflict and have vowed to uphold a UN arms embargo. The conflict pits powerful General Khalifa Haftar against the UN-backed government of national accord. Although both Libyan warring sides were present, they did not meet on Sunday. German Chancellor Chancellor Angela Merkel said the two sides were briefed and consulted by the other parties. Alongside Mrs. Merkel, other attendees included Russia's President Vladimir Putin, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, French President Emmanuel Macron and UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson. But that escalation has reached in the last few days a very dangerous dimension. Until now, we had an escalation of a Libyan conflict with some foreign interference. Now we were facing the risk of a true regional escalation. And that risk was averted in Berlin, 
provided, of course, that it is possible to maintain the truce and then to move into a ceasefire. But that escalation that was taking place and was becoming extremely dangerous, today there is a strong commitment to stop it. Still on the Libya conflict, the EU says it's considering ways to support a ceasefire in Libya, including a possible military-led mission on the ground. Foreign ministers are meeting in Brussels one day after the Berlin Peace Conference brought together Libya's war in sides and several world powers. But fighting broke out south of Tripoli just hours after that summit came to an end. EU's top diplomat, Joseph Borrell, says any peace settlement will need the bloc's support. There are several possibilities, but you know, a uh, ceasefire requires someone to take care of it. No? You cannot say this is a ceasefire and then forget about it. No? Uh, the arms control, embargo control, um, there are several possibilities and the ministers will have to decide what to do in order to help implement the agreements of yesterday conference. Well, let's get more on this story from an African affairs analyst joining me in the studio, Dr. Okwe Okwala. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. It's always my pleasure to be with you. So the conflict in Libya has been going on for years now, and there's been various peace meetings to try and you know, resolve the situation. What do you think the significance of this Berlin summit held over the weekend is? Well, the significance is that um, the major world powers... We're there. The major multilateral organizations are. We're there. The major supporters of different factions, both General Kafa and uh, the government that is recognized by United Nations, they were there. They were I mean, support of the, pro the project, and they were, I mean, according to Angela Merkel, they were consulted and they were briefed as the mission is going on. So I think it's a, 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 little more, a, a lot more inclusive. And I can see that if an agreement is reached, like the resolution, they, they reached a resolution, I think a 51 or 57 point resolution that covered wide area of issues, the issue of ceasefire, maintaining the, I mean, uh, halting the escalation of the conflict, maintaining a ceasefire, the process, mm -hmm. returning to the process, political process, and um, security sector reform and all that. Them different, different areas that we are likely going to, if they follow through. And then, of course, they had a committee, five plus five committee, that is five from both sides of the, in the conflict, to form a committee monitored by the United Nations mission in, in Libya uh, through, the, um, through the committee. So uh, the, the, uh, then that, with that, you know, I believe that there will be, there's a good chance mm. that this time around we may move not only from halting the escalation, but actually towards a, a, a more permanent solution. Well, Dr. Oki, we have to remember that just hours after, you know, that meeting, fighting broke out south of Tripoli, and the solutions that are being preferred by the world leaders, there's some kind of conflicting um, solutions. At the summit, German can uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel said a political solution is needed for the Libyan crisis, not a military action. But the EU is saying something completely different. Uh, you know, it's saying considering it's considering a military-led mission on the ground. Which solution do you think is best for this situation? Well, to start with, you know, it's not on usual when I mean when at the point of having a major ceasefire for the parties to try to test each other to know whether they will gain position before eventually the the the, the ceasefire and other agreement come into effect. It may that may be what is happening here. And that does not necessarily mean that there's no good chance of this agreement, I mean really solving a real problem. Secondly, you know um, is the position of EU is not directly opposed to that of the parties. Uh, there is a former American president who said, if you want peace, prepare for war. Mm -hmm. The best thing is to negotiate, go through the political process, like the German chancellor said. Then, but there is that chance that there will be one stubborn person who, or one or two, who may not want to. In that case, you know, it may be necessary to use, to show him, to show your muzzle, to know, look, we can beat you into line. Uh, so I think it is both, it's okay. I, I hope that's what it is. But the first thing 
the price, because the military action is very costly. It cannot be the first option. It cannot be, it can only be the last option when every party has been given opportunity to feel that, look, given assurance that, look, whatever process that will come will involve you, you will play a, very, a, a role, and nobody is going to victimize you. You are not likely going to be victimized or going to pay a huge price for what, whatever role you have played before. And if that process is done, I mean, a lot, a lot of, um, even those who may want to be stopped may not have enough followers. Mm -hmm. Then it will be easier to, I mean, use for, uh, military action to beat them into line. Well, with so many parties involved now, how easy will it be to implement this truce that was agreed? Uh, it's, well, I, they've already formed a committee. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, they, they also made a provision for a follow-up uh, group through the United, Mission, uh, United Nations mission in Libya and, and, and under the auspices of the United Nations. They, they, they formed a committee also that for, involved the combatants. So I think the mechanism for monitoring implementation and the ensuring that is there. How will they work on ground is another question. But I think they thought of that and they made provision for that. Okay, let's talk about the foreign interference. You know, there's some analysts believe that you know, foreign intervention is only escalating the, the situation in the region. What do you think about this? Of course, that, that, is, uh, that is what has kept the conflict since 2011 up to now. However, you know, uh, with the consequences of a proliferation of our small arms and everything and the destruction that have followed, both lives and property that followed it. However, this time around, I think the supporters, I mean, the, support, the key supporters of the various combatants in the, on ground we are involved in that conference. If they came with good faith, if they came into that conference with good faith, and let me assume, and I wish that they did, and then with major powers brokering the agreement, knowing that, look, if you also misbehave, not only the major powers also, remember that there are four multinational organizations, mm. United Nations, European Union, uh, Arab League, and African Union. All these things broke. So, it will be more difficult for people to walk away, I mean, at the agreement that they, they sat together to, because there are a lot of people that will follow up and monitor. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe that, that there's a good chance that Libya may have, may eventually move towards peace. So you're saying so this Berlin conference will, could bring about peace for Libya? It could, but then it, it depends on how, it manage, how, how well it's managed. But I think so far, I mean, on paper, it appears that they are... Um, okay, Dr. Okiopala, hold you on that. Mm -hmm. African Affairs Analyst, Dr. Okiopala, thank you so much for joining us on Network Africa. You're always welcome. Moving on now, here in Nigeria, over 5,000 vulnerable and less privileged people suffering from different ailments are receiving free medical attention in seven local government areas in Adamawa State. The exercise is at the behest of the Adamawa State government, a federal lawmaker and a non-governmental organization aimed at providing free health care to vulnerable communities affected by security challenges in the area. A team of medical practitioners drawn from different parts of the country are partnering with the Adamawa State Government to bring free medical outreach to the people as basic health facilities have taken a hit due to the farmers' headers crisis and attacks by bandits which have rendered thousands homeless. The four-day outreach begins in Gaye and surrounding communities as men, women and children are out early to take advantage of this opportunity. I myself am facing eye problem. So you call it short side or something like that. So we get it. So this type of program, program is the program that we are expecting from our leaders all the time. A young woman who's had challenges with her previous pregnancies also had an opportunity to finally give birth to a baby girl. I'm very happy because this my baby is a precious baby. It's a, it's, it's a miracle baby. The lead surgeon also confirms that all surgeries ranging from hernia, eye surgery, fibroids and caesarean sections were successful. I'm still in the theater. Uh, it's 9 p.m. I will still have to take a very bad case. We still have to take one other emergency cesarean section, which is going to make the fifth. 
The principal medical officer here laments the lack of manpower to carry out such a large-scale exercise. We don't have enough humanities, particularly what we call the professionals. When I mean the professionals, I mean the doctors, the nurses, the pharmacists, the lab, lab technicians, lab, uh, lab scientists. The senator representing Adamawa South Senatorial Zone, overwhelmed by the turnout of people needing help at this outreach, re-echoes the concerns of many. The simple treatments that people desire, uh, they cannot access them because the population has grown and the facilities we have, the infrastructure we have, has not grown uh, in proportion to the growth in population. The people of this community are eagerly looking forward to the rebuilding and rehabilitation of health facilities in this area so that access to health services is not based on periodic medical interventions alone. Still to come on the program. We'll take you inside the first Pan-African Touring Art Show. That's a moment. Stay with us.